Good morning. Good morning. At CSL, we have chosen seven core values that highlight the focus of this spiritual community. They are love, healing, oneness, abundance, spiritual growth, service, and diversity. Today, the spotlight shines brightly on love. I'm Jeannie Luper-Smith, and I'm a storyteller, so I'm going to tell you a true story about love. It was 1967, late July, a time the culture dubbed the summer of love. How prophetic that was to be. I had just given birth to my first child, and I had done it alone. Husbands and fathers in the 1960s weren't allowed anywhere near the delivery room. Their contribution took place nine months earlier. <laughs> and as far as medical community was concerned, that was quite adequate, thank you. So I labored alone and delivered my baby with just the obstetrician and a nurse in the cold, sterile delivery suite. But I soon wasn't alone, and I was about to have the most spiritual experience of my life. Earlier in the year, my husband and I had moved from the Midwest to Washington, D.C. We rented a charming brick first floor duplex in Arlington, Virginia. Our landlords occupied the space above us. I hit town three months pregnant and needed to find an obstetrician double quick. My female landlord suggested Dr. John Walsh, who was her OBGYN. Dr. John Walsh, I soon learned, had delivered the children of President John Kennedy and First Lady Jackie Kennedy. Dr. Walsh had an exclusive DC clientele, as I discovered when I observed his other female patients calling down for their cars and chauffeurs. 20-year-old pregnant me hailed a cab at the curb, but I rode home driving by the same Lincoln and Jefferson memorials that they saw from the windows of their limos. And I had a delicious six degrees of separation since that the same doctor who had seen Jackie Kennedy up close and personal, if you know what I mean, <laughs> had seen me that way too. Dr. Walsh, garbed in his scrubs and me in my hospital gown with my feet in the stirrups of the delivery table, had leveled the socioeconomic playing field as I broke through the pain barrier and pushed out the new life that was going with home with me at the end of the experience. It's a boy. This was my first look at my first baby. 54 years ago, there were no prenatal ultrasound images, no early peaks into the uterus, no gender reveal parties, no sonogram photos posted on social media or the refrigerator. So until this moment, I didn't know anything about my baby except that he was already deeply loved. My fresh from spirit son, Jay, was placed into a small plexiglass bassinet and wheeled alongside me where I was still on my back on the table. Conventional wisdom then was that newborns couldn't focus and couldn't see. To this, allow me to use a technical term, balderdash. I wanted to use another word starting with B, but I thought I better not push my luck. <laughs> My son swaddled, swaddled tightly in a blanket and just mere minutes from his arrival on the planet looked directly into my eyes, 
with a gaze that pierced me like a laser. And I knew in that electric moment that we already had a connection that went beyond anything I could have imagined. It was as if we had always known each other, that this was a reunion. And with his eyes, he was saying, I know you, I'm here, I see you, we're together. Even though I thought I would give birth without anyone I loved in the room, I couldn't have been more mistaken. Sometimes the biggest love shows up in the most unusual places and in the smallest spiritual packages. The core value today is love. When Dr. Chris asked me to do this talk, he emailed me the talk title, Improving Your Attitude. I wasn't wearing my readers, and I thought he wrote, Improving Your Attire. <laughs> wow, what I could do with that. I saw myself making several wardrobe changes during this talk, kind of like a share concert. Later, after a second read and trying not to take the Improving Your Attitude title too personally, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to channel my inner share, and I'd have to stick with just one outfit. No fun in that, but it did uh, follow the talk title because it required me to improve my attitude around the whole situation. But maybe I can combine the two, improving my attitude and my attire. Now, what does attire have to do with an attitude change? Bear with me, because I'm in the middle of getting rid of things that I've hung on to, attire and attitudes. I believe that it's not just the tangible things we need to let go, but decluttering on the inside is just as important. I'm smack dab in the middle of the process, and I realized that I needed the help of a professional or two. There are lots of professionals and processes for letting things go, for seeing things we've accumulated through a different lens and with a different perspective. I need to get rid of a lifetime of accumulation as I'm not getting any younger and my kids don't want my stuff. <laughs> when you've lived as long as I have, you've collected things, clothing, memorabilia, people, and attitudes. But for a moment, let's talk about clothing and the emotional punch it carries and why it's so hard to let it go. Clothing looms large in my life. I can remember what I wore when I was three years old. I go way back in the Haute Couture hit parade. I've heard it said, jokingly or not, that graceful aging is all about fabric and lighting. When I put fabric and attire under the spotlight, I realize that many of my own memories, both light and dark, intersect with what I was wearing in those flashback moments that have lasted a lifetime. Recently, I was helping a friend who was moving across the country go through her voluminous wardrobe, and as she pulled suits, dresses, pants, shoes, and jackets out of the closet for the keep, discard, donate piles, I asked her, when looking back through her lifetime, if she had a favorite dress or outfit. It created a conversation 
that was dripping with emotion from both of our lives. Several items of clothing made the cut for my own question when I thought about choosing just one piece that was my most impactful. My earliest memories of dressing for success started with me sitting in the front seat of our 1948 Plymouth with my mother. My mother found a seamstress in our small Midwestern town that was worthy of Broadway or Hollywood. And as it was almost Easter, my fashionista mother presented three-year-old me with several small samples of fabric that could be made into my Easter suit. I remember holding the swatches of fabric in my plump little hand and choosing a navy and white checked one from the pile of choices. I felt grown up and excited that I'd be in on the creative early stage planning of something that I would wear. I realize now that rather than the Easter suit itself, it was the moment with my mother as a little girl. And it was just the beginning. My clothing memories are lined up like slides in a carousel projector. There are a parade of brightly colored cotton dresses that 1950s girls like me wore everywhere, even to play with dressier versions for church, accompanied by white gloves, white anklets, and shiny black patent leather sh shoes. I see the wool pleated skirt and dyed to match sweater that I wore to a junior high school party where everyone but me was asked to dance even the girl who still sucked her thumb. <laughs> There's the gorgeous bugle beaded yellow chiffon dress with the billowing full skirt worn when I was a high school homecoming queen that my father, after severe financial reverses, borrowed the money for. And then, seeing that very same dress worn that year, 1964, by Mary Tyler Moore as Laura Petrie in the Dick Van Dyke TV show. There's my wedding dress, bought on a budget, made from a bridesmaid's dress with the add-on of long sleeves, creating a late 1960s version of bridal elegance the lacy white nightgown I wore on my wedding night, a shapeless navy blue cotton maternity top that I sewed myself while carrying the daughter who would be the last baby I would carry, a fabulous gray flannel floor-length cocktail dress trimmed with ostrich feathers that hugged my post-pregnancy back in shape body, a pair of groovy purple bell-bottomed polyester pants that were my 1970s go-to when my sons and daughter as toddlers were tugging on my legs. Professional suits with massively big shoulder pads that I wore to work in the 1980s. I could pull a fashion favorite from every decade, but I'm under some time constraints here. And I see that it's not the dress or the top or the pants that took center stage. It was the moment each item evoked from the tapestry of my life. Given all I've shared about my love of clothing and the emotional punch that's often attached to it, it's no wonder I'm looking for ways to pare down and to eliminate things that no longer fit. And that's not just relegated to what I wear. But first, the clutter of which clothing is just a part. Enter Marie Kondo, master declutterer 
and author of Spark Joy, and then a separate process called Swedish Death Cleaning. You knew I wasn't going to do a talk uh, without mentioning death. And in fact, surprise, that we're all going to die. So, what is Swedish death cleaning? And do we really have to go there, CSL? Yes, we do. Some of us can't wrap our heads around death, especially our own. And as a result, we put off doing the things we need to do to prepare for our exit, and we leave a mess for someone else to clean up. We may spend our whole lives acquiring things that end up in storage units, slowly losing the punch of sentiment and memory and transforming into a bunch of junk. The benefit of death cleaning to our loved ones is that they won't have to do it. But what about the happiness and enjoyment of organizing and letting things go while we're still here? Psychology and sociology offer some explanations for why going through our possessions, paring down, and clearing clutter can really be helpful and why getting rid of some of the abundance we've accumulated creates a more pleasant and comfortable life. Messiness is an unnecessary source of irritation. If you pare down, the argument is that you can better focus on what's really important in life. Psychotherapist Amy Morin says, when there is less chaos on the outside, we're likely to feel less chaos on the inside. Multiple studies link clutter with stress and decreased productivity. Getting rid of items can serve as a reminder that things don't last forever, including us. Going through all of your things can serve as a reminder for you of who you are, how you see yourself, and how you want others to see you after your death, your legacy, she adds. And again, getting rid of the stuff we don't need means that someone else won't have to, even though I can't believe that my adult children don't want to put up a, pull up a chair and go through my grade school report cards. <clears throat> Starting the process sooner rather than later is important as we're likely uh, to put off going through our stuff as we age because it's labor intensive to do it and it's not only physical work but it's emotional and cognitive work. So how do we do the actual work? <clears throat> Excuse me, this is my rock and roll voice. <clears throat> How do we do the actual work of deciding what stays in the closet and what comes out? What if I still had every one of those dresses and items hanging in my closet that I mentioned earlier? Would I still have the memories? Of course I would. I'll take those with me wherever I go. Marie Kondo of Spark Joy fame has created an international business enterprise around how to let go of our possessions, whether those be clothing, books, papers, or sentimental items. To boil it down, the criterion for deciding what to keep and what to discard is whether or not something sparks joy. She says it's important to touch each item, to hold it in both of our hands, and even put it to our hearts. Then pay attention to how our body responds when we do this. When something sparks joy, we will feel it in our bodies as if our cells are slowly rising. When something doesn't bring us joy, 
we'll feel it in our bodies as heaviness. Remember, we are not deciding what to discard, but what to keep. And we're keeping only those things that truly bring us joy. And when we discard anything that doesn't, we thank it before we say goodbye. All right, as I'm decluttering and discarding, I've got a roadmap now for how to make some of those choices. But what about the attitudes we carry that are still hanging in our closets? 12-step programs remind us to make a fearless inventory of them. And what about the attachments to people, places, relationships, jobs, thoughts, and emotions that we drag around with us that no longer serve us? How do we decide what to keep and what to discard from the emotional closet of our past and our present? Those things, unlike outdated pieces of clothing that no longer fit, can sometimes feel comfy and familiar. But there are reasons why something may no longer serve us. Maybe this thing never really did serve us, and we just didn't realize it. Perhaps we adopted beliefs, roles, habits, and attitudes that belong to other people. But because we grew up with them, we never really put them under the microscope of our own lives. We may have a matched set of fears and defense mechanisms that were relevant once. Are they still? Maybe a particular behavior served us once, but our focus has changed and we're going in a new direction, and it's no longer helpful. Maybe a friendship or a relationship had a shelf life. Once we enjoyed it, or not, but now it's time to let it go. Like fresh produce, it was for a season. Now it's old, and maybe a bit rotten. Are you still hanging on to something that once you thought you wanted and needed? But when you got it, it wasn't what you thought. Or, like a childhood toy, it no longer holds your attention because you've grown and outgrown it. We've had many lives in a lifetime, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, aging, death. There are many points of change in each phase that can lead us to a new life. The more we hold on to, the less room there is for something new. It's time, no matter our age, to try on something new, something with a better fit. Let's air out and discard old, antiquated attitudes and release fear, past mistakes, worry, toxic relationships, people-pleasing, self-doubt, comparison, things we can't control, and chasing perfection. I say we adopt Marie Kondo's approach in our emotional lives, holding each person, each thought, each feeling, each situation, each attitude close to our hearts to see if they spark joy, if they resonate with our souls. If they do, embrace them. Hang on to them and hang them up in the closet with love. And if something or someone no longer works, 
Let's bring them out of the mothballs, say thank you, show appreciation, and then say goodbye. Because no matter what we've experienced or who we've experienced, each person and all of it has informed who we are today. And when we're deciding what to keep, let's not forget to put back on the shelf the truth of who we are, whole, perfect, and complete, that all we need is within us, that we are spirit, God, expressing in us, as us, and through us. We are love, and we are enough. We are more than enough. And when we're finished with tidying up on the outside and the inside, let's improve our attire and our attitude and put on something fabulous and celebrate what we've accomplished. Maybe even do a little dance around the literal and figurative keep, donate, discard piles. I think I may wear my yellow chiffon, bugle beaded homecoming queen dress, and a crown, and dance to shares if I could turn back time. Because it's always good to be queen. But if that dress doesn't fit, I may just suck my thumb. <laughs> and so ends the lesson. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let's take a moment now to be quiet. What a concept. We are here to love. We are love. So let's turn on all the love lights and go within. connect with our inner divinity, uncluttered by what we've collected throughout our lives, and let's breathe in and breathe out love. Let's clothe ourselves in the love of spirit, God, and let's drop every old attitude and anything else that no longer sparks joy. And 
now, every Sunday, we have a closing affirmation. Please read it with me. I love my life. Every day is a new opportunity for something good. And our closing prayer will be led by Dr. Ferdinand Cabrera, our presider and prayer practitioner and my sweet, dear friend. Thank you. Okay, let's go with it. Let's know that there's one infinite power, one essence, one presence, and that's the power of spirit. That infinite presence supports, sustains, and creates everything that, is do, that it does. And everything that it does is good. And you and I are part of that goodness. That essence resides at the center of our being. So for this week, for today, we de I declare for all of us that we're changing that attitude for good. That the freedom, that the power, that the will of God exists in us with the purpose and intention to set us free. Free of limitations, free of anything that is unlike the truth that we are. And for this we give thanks, knowing that it's done as we accept it and believe it. And so it is. CSL family, we have loved having you here today in the room and online. Please join us next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. See you then. Thank you for watching and thanks for supporting CSL. If you'd like to know more about us, check us out on our website or social media. Blessings.